Chapter 36 The Very Strange Tale of Midnight Shower I got shit make you horny. Make your mare horny. Make you hard. Make you happy. Make you strong. Make you smart. And, of course, I got the drug. The shit that'll make you fly. Dash. Blam! The blood wing screeched as the bullet from my sniper rifle tore through its abdomen. The dark shadow tucked in its wings, spiraling downwards, disappearing in the storm. Sheets of rain lashed across the sky bandit. I was relaying more on sats than I was on my own vision. Above us, Steelhooves was doing the same. The rhythmic booming of his grenade machine gun and the shrieks of the blood wings filled the air. Where the hell did they come from? Clamity shouted, firing the twin guns of his battle saddle as the dark form of one of the giant bats swooped up in front of us. There were far too many, or far more than the dozen I had originally counted. This was a whole damn flock. I heard a thud of one of them as it landed on steel hooves above, biting at his armor in a futile effort to pierce it. Another swirled out of the rain and slammed into the side of the sky bandit, rocking it, sending me tumbling backwards off the bench I had perched on. My sniper rifle clattered to the ground. Green flame erupted across the sky bandit. The burning blood wing let out an ear-splitting scream of agony and fell away in the heavy rain, washed away the flames. Pyrolite flashed through the air, piercing the air with a battle cry as she did so. I blinked, struck by the impression that the Balefire Phoenix had a vengeful hatred for the creatures. Another blood wing latched itself onto the opposite side of the passenger wagon, viciously thrusting its head into the windows, gnashing at us. Velvet Omini's combat shotgun roared, and I was splattered with what had been the insides of the creature's head. As Zenith looked at the body of the Bloodwing and knocked it away, I threw myself to my hooves, leaving the sniper rifle and drawing out little Macintosh. We were in the thick of them now, and Applejack's trusty little revolver was the fastest and most powerful weapon I had. For a moment, I felt bad for our zebra. Her fighting style was useless in this situation. I leapt into the window, slipping into sats, and taking aim at the first dark shadow I saw. Blam! Blam! The first two shots went through the Bloodwing's back. The second tore through a hole in its wing. It fell from the sky, only for another to take its place, lunging towards my window. Blam! 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 The creature's momentum carried its body to the side of the sky bandit with a meaty thump. I heard the impact of meat on metal and a tearing sound. The black mass of two blood wings tumbling into the drenched air behind us. Steel wings entangled between them as they fell, disappearing into the torrential downpour. I cried out, throwing out a telekinetic net, but he was gone. And a second later, several more blood wings were swirling about us. One of them was engulfed in green flame from beneath. A few yards back, Zenith kicked open the door to the passenger wagon, staring out at the black forms whirling around us in the blankets of rain. Before I realized what she was planning, the zebra leapt, soaring out in the air and landing on the back of one of those giant bats. She drove the spear of her hellhound helmet through the monster's head, then jumped from its falling corpse towards the nearest opponent. And I had felt sorry for her, I thought, watching as she impacted the creature's wing and slashed it off with her hellhound claw horn before falling into the darkness where more unsuspecting blood wings awaited. I should feel sorry for her enemies. A giant bat dove onto Calamity, its huge wings dwarfing his own. I spun, targeted, and fired. Blam! Click, click. Little Macintosh's remaining bullet tore into the monster. It squealed, and Calamity tried to buck it off, but the bat sunk its huge razor-sharp fangs into the pegasus. Calamity screamed. Velvet Remedy galloped past me, firing repeatedly with her combat shotgun, tearing the monster to pieces before it could drink. The sky bandit lurched in the air. Calamity was hurt badly, and the ripped corpse of the giant bat was still latched onto him. But he was not dead. A moment later, I saw how horribly close he had come to dying. The sky bandit dropped, jolting with turbulence. As Calamity fought to land, the ground came into view, 
and I could see the two figures we had been rushing to save. Two young zebras, no older than the young mare with the arbru mark. Clear glass. As I reloaded, a blood wing dropped onto one of the zebras, knocking her to the ground. I tried to move faster, but it took only a second. The monster plunged his fangs into the zebra's side and drank. The zebra withered into a desecrated husk, faster than her brain could die. No! Damn it! No! I howled, snapping little Macintosh shut. I targeted the monster with sats as it coverted, or it coverted over its kill. Yeah, I was right. But the blood wing was torn apart by a charging zenith before I could pull the trigger. I do not understand, Zenith said. Why were the three of you traveling such dangerous hills and in such a storm? We were huddled under the glistening dome of Velvet Remedy's uh, shield spell. I watched as barrels of rain cascaded down over the barrier of light, struck by the strange beauty of it. The surviving young zebra had been dried by repeated use of Velvet's cleaning spell, as had we all and was wrapped in a blanket from our supplies, which had been, which had needed similar de-drenching. Zenith had built a fire and was sitting next to it, across from the other zebra, a pot of purely vegetable soup beginning to bubble between them. The young zebra had just seen his two friends die in a most horrible manner. He needed more than a blanket. I knew it wasn't much, but I had come to believe in the miraculous power of hugs. Zenith, however, didn't hug. Zenith didn't touch, unless it was to hurt something. Velvetrem was tending to climb his wounds, and her magic, and Zenith's bleeding, or bleed-stopping goop, to remove the fangs embedded in the Pegasus' back safely, before medical potions could be administered. None of us had seen any signs of our Applejack's ranger. Getting up, I trotted over to the young zebra buck, and lay down next to him. I'm so sorry, I whispered. We... I should have been faster. I paused, unsure if I suddenly embraced this strange zebra, if it was the best thing for him after all. And, to my shame, a tiny part of my mind warned me that I had been fooled into caring for evil folk before. I mentally dropped an anvil on that part of me, and then banished it to the moon. Instead, I put a tender hoof on one of his, holding it gently, just a simple touch. He stared, looking first surprised, then grateful. We had to, he said at last. We were too old. Looking at Zenith, he questioned. You are not from Glyphmark? Glyphmark? Zenith asked. The younger zebra nodded. I am sad to say I do not know of this place. This is a zebra village? What do you mean, too old? Calamity asked, grunting. He gritted his teeth as Velvet Remedy pulled the second fang free and quickly applied a hoof covered in Zenith's mixture to the flowing wound. The zebra looked at us strangely. Who are you, ponies? Friends, I answered gently. He looked at me with suspicion, then sadness. My friends are dead. He turned to Zenith. Quoth and Zoon, nah, have been my friends since we could walk. We did everything together. We even, we even got our marks together. He choked, tears forming in his young eyes. We, we got k kicked out of the t t tribe together. Now, I hugged him. I held him. I let him sob into my side. The downpour finally relented, leaving a light drizzle in its wake. I walked into the sky, or looked into the sky, turning my gaze towards the mountains. There, nestled in the open jaw of a cliff, were the darkened spires of the Catala ruins. We could be there in hours, but we were going the other way. Velvetrami's beautiful voice rang across the hilltops. No more lying, living in this gilded cage, shackled to what it's supposed to be. I'm ready to exit this stage. It is time for this bird to fly free. Clementy cut in with perfect timing, his voice a pleasant counterpoint to the luxurious voice of the unicorn mare. 
I've been blinded because I've closed my eyes, seeing just what they told me to see. Time to get up and shake off the lies, break the rules, stretch my wings, and just leave. Together, they belted forth the chorus of their duet, their voices daring the slate gray sky and the ceaseless rain to even try to make the day gloomy. I'd miss this. We were trotting towards Glyphmark. Calamity flew alongside me, pulling the sky bandit. No more than a pony's height above the ground. The mere idea of boarding the flying fang had driven the young zebra to panic. So we walked, escorting him towards his new home. It was better this way anyway, I thought. I had been cooped up in the passenger wagon for days, recovering physically from my head trauma and psychologically from the most soul-destroying worst day ever of my lifetime. Physically, I was healed. Mentally, I was capable of pushing on. What I had done would never heal. The reality of that turned my thoughts to steel hooves. Another reason for the walk. I had to trust he would find us, and when he did, it would be best if we were on the ground. Otherwise, he might just shoot a missile to get our attention. I cannot hope to change things if I don't even try. I cannot heal another if I lay down and die. There's a whole world beneath us, a whole sky above. As the voices of Velvet Remedy and Calamity joined forces once more, for the last line of the verse and another ringing chorus, I turned to my zebra companion. The zebra trotted along beside me, the young one between us. Do you still wish to seek out the tribe itself? There is no need, Zenith intoned gravely. My daughter is no longer with them. The young zebra had openly wept, unable to stop once he had started. He had blubbered, sobbing, and mourning the loss of his friends. And in the spaces between his words, I began to construct a picture of what had happened. The trio of friends had come from the tribe that Zenith's daughter had been part of, the tribe that formed from those who were left behind when the slavers fell upon Zenith and his village. Zebra foals, all of them. My parents and husband were slain in the fight, Zenith had told us. My daughter was too young for stern slave pits, and she had no place in red-eyed schools. So Stern left her there, along with the other children. An entire tribe of children, living under the shared belief that being an adult meant being ripe for the slavers, but having adults in the tribe invited attack. And while the slavers would not take children, that didn't mean they wouldn't do much more horrible things to them. And just how do they decide when a zebra is suddenly too old? Clamity had asked. The answer was obvious. It wasn't a matter of birthdays. It was a matter of maturity. You were too old when you got your mark. Just like in Stable 2, when you got your cutie mark, you were an adult. And from that moment, you joined the workforce. Only here, in this zebra tribe, it was a dreaded event. I nodded to Zenith. She had suffered from the slave pits for many years since the attack on her village. Her daughter was young, but hardly an infant, and the zebra with us only vaguely recalled when the mare had herself been ostracized from the tribe. If she still lives, my daughter will be in Glyphmark. Glyphmark sucked. I looked down the hill towards the row of sad, dilapidated shacks with their sunken roofing leading to a half-collapsed building in a yard of junk. The whole town was surrounded by a wall of scrap and that couldn't keep out a rat hog. The ground was dark and lifeless. The hoof full of zebras looked battered and dejected, their eyes downcast, their heads low, their manes and tails tangled and unkept. The town looked like it was just waiting to die. I could make out letters spelling Angel on the front of the ruined building. 
the last remaining word of a forgotten name. Whatever angel had once watched over this town, it had fallen. As we approached, the zebras looked up fearfully. I saw two of them nudge a third forward. The mare stepped towards us. We surrender. Just, just don't kill us, she called out. We don't have anything, but take whatever you want. I could feel my barely mended heart breaking. This is Glyphmark? Zenith asked in a tone of disbelief. The young zebra buck with us nodded, rocking slightly on his hooves, looking sucker bucked. Velvet Remedy trotted forward. Hello, she said gently, her voice calming. Don't be afraid. We mean you no harm. We are just travelers who happened to cross or make happened to cross a newly marked buck, and offered to help him make his way here in safety in all the rain. Conflicting emotions swam across swam across the faces of the zebras. I could tell how desperate they were for the approaching strangers to intend no malice, yet how hard it was for them to believe it. Having brought him here, we will depart at once if you wish, although I would ask your indulgence. We have trotted far and seek a safe place to rest. Safe? the zebra mare asked, her voice cracking with a bitter laugh. Pony lady, there is no safe place here. We are all just waiting for the slavers to come. The only question is whether the raiders or the monsters will have any left of us alive for when they get here. She waved us into the town anyway. With every step, the town got worse. Bleaker. As if despair and hopelessness had sunk into the very planks of the shacks like the cloud and was radiating out of it. How do you survive here? Velvet asked, her voice almost a whisper. I knew what she was seeing. There were no crops here, no gardens. The zebras were armed with crude spears and small, badly maintained pistols that were no match for creatures like bloodwings. These were not hunters, trappers of small game at best. The zebras were all emaciated. I could see how the shadows of their bones through their coats. They were all starving. When Velvet put words into our observations, the nearest zebra responded, Nothing grows here. This town is just close enough to Canterlot that the cloud has poisoned the ground. And at our looks of alarm, she added, but far enough away that it's not in the air anymore. The zebra mare who had ushered us into the town explained, The building up there was a laboratory for veterinary medicine. I was surprised by how educated she sounded. The trapped children were far better off than those who were they kicked out. But I had to wonder how long that could last. Without adults, there would be no replenishing the tribe. In a few years, the tribe wouldn't be a tribe anymore. Just one t child telling another to go away. There's an old hydroponics bay in the basement. Most of what they were growing down there is poisonous, the zebra mare sat, stated, and stared at the ground, shuddering heavily. We learned that the hard way. But we've been surviving on what was not, and what was left in the vendor machines. But even that is almost gone now. I'm sorry, but we have nothing to feed you. Loud under waved a hoof. Banish the thought. We have some supplies. Let us feed you. I exchanged looks with calamity. Then nodded. Those supplies were meant to feed us while on Canterlot and on the trip back. But these zebras clearly needed it more than we did. And, in comparison to me, they were far more deserving. None of them had slaughtered a whole town in a blind rage recently, and their suffering made mine look petty. Veterinary medicine? Calamity questioned as we drew closer to the building. What had looked like scrap from a distance still looked like scrap up close. But it was clearly military scrap. Broken down military robots huddled around war chariots so rusted and decayed that they were barely recognizable. Piles of empty ammo boxes littered one corner, as well as parts of several turret mo models. A much larger version of the flying contraption we had discovered in Old Olney was strewn about the... across half a lot, upside down. 
Stone pillars flanked the scant remains of a road, leading into the yard around it. A cracked placard reading Angel Bunny Pharmaceuticals. The name was not so forgotten after all. I remembered Zenith's claim about Fluttershy's pet rabbit had created the combat drug, Stampede. I found myself wondering if the rabbit had somehow built this company. Then I faced Hoof at my own foolishness. Knowing what I did to Fluttershy, it was the most natural thing for the Ministry of Peace to have a branch dedicated solely to the welfare of animals. And of course, she would have it named after her own favorite pet. The military took over, I surmised, after I spotted the hunk of a sentinel robot. I wondered if part of this lab was repurposed for creating Stampede. With a start, I realized that the poor zebras in this town were living under the shadow of Doom Bunny. The irony was so bitter, I had to buy back a laugh. What about trade? Calamity asked. No caravans stop here, the zebra mare told us. There's nothing that any pony wants here anyway. And we have nothing to buy supplies with. Over him gasped in horror, as the zebra hobbled out of one of the shacks, teetering on only three legs. The remains of the fourth looking badly infected. You don't have a doctor either, do you? Not anymore. We made the full circle. There wasn't much of the town to see. Our host waved a forehoof. Sleep wherever you want. Is this all? Zenith asked slowly as another zebra walked by, eyeing us curiously. I found myself staring. The zebra had used charcoal to outline her stripes so heavily that she looked like a black-coated zebra with white stripes, rather than the reverse. Don't mind gloom, our guide told us dismissively. Zenith shook her head. Are there no other zebras here? The zebra mare shook her head. The other zebra mare, Gloom, turned. The nightmare moons took them. Six years ago. They are all dead now. Wish I was. The nightmare moons took them? I asked. Our host nodded. They came and took half of us. I do not know why. They have never played any attention to us before. Zenith looked pained. Was one of the ones taken named Zephyr? The striped mare blinked at Zenith. Yes. At Zenith's stricken expression, the other zebra turned away, looking instead to Velvet Remedy. She was our doctor. I pushed forward, catching the zebra mare's attention. Which way did they go? You do not have to rescue them, just because one of them is my daughter, Zina said as I reloaded my guns. Nor because you feel you need to make up for the cannibal town. No, I agreed, slipping a little Macintosh back into its holster. We need to do this, because it's the right thing to do. Yep, Calamity agreed, trotting up next to us, clad in his enclave armor, minus the helmet. He'd spent a lot of his spare time since old Olney, jerry-rigging it to find a way to fire the Nova Surge rifles without wearing the helmet. Plus, I hate to say it, but this might be on us. I stopped. What? I started Calamity. I reckon the goddess ain't stupid, Calamity responded. She's figured out she's got a blind spot, and she's experimenting. This... This had to do with the memories I had stolen from myself, didn't it? Well, if it wasn't settled before... I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. I turned to Velvet in surprise. Unicorn shook her head. These ponies need a doctor. Not when you come back with theirs, but now. It has been five days since the Alicorns attacked Glyphmark, and that is five days too many. I could see it in her eyes. She believed that she had something to make up for, and she wasn't re ready to turn away from another pony or zebra in need. I stepped forward and gave her a hug. Stay safe. I should be telling that to you, she replied. Pilot landed on a rusted barrel next to us and hooted quizzically. Velvet gave the beautiful bird a nuzzle before saying, 
Go with them, please, Pyrolite. Keep them safe. The bird nodded, giving a little salute with one of her wings. Looking to Calamity, Velvet demanded, Bring them all back, without any new holes. I'll do my best, he said, tipping his hat. I released Velvet Remedy, and turned towards Zenith and Calamity. So, do either of you know anything about the place we're heading to? Zebra Town? The answer I got from both of them was an unsurprising no. Once more, we were headed into the unknown. It felt like it had been raining forever. I was panting as we ascended yet another hill, rethinking the wisdom of walking to Zebra Town. Hearing that Zebra Town was only an afternoon's trot away, Clementine suggested we travel on hoof, and I had agreed, suspecting the Sky Bandit would be too visible and the Alicorns would be looking for it. Now, I realized the idea of trotting back over these muddy hills with freed zebras in tow, and possibly alicorns chasing us, was just stupid. I heard a whistle in the air above us. It didn't help that Calamity wasn't exactly traveling on hoof. Looking down, I saw another little valley with spots of asphalt indicating a nearly vanished road. There was another ancient store hut down there, amongst the collapsed sections of fence. The body of a dead bloodwing sprawled over the roof, and a second was impaled on the iron struts of what, until recently, had been a windmill. A figure was galloping towards us from the other side of the hut, clad in metal armor, striped in applejack red. Whole big old valley to land in, and you managed to hit one hut, Clamity shouted to him, grinning. I raced down the hill to meet him. Zenith followed at a much more reserved pace. Watch out, Clamity warned as I reached Steel Hooves. She's gotten huggy lately. I seem to recall it was you who hugged her, the Applejack Strangers retorted. A welcome hint of good humor in his normal, tacturn rumble. Minutes later, we stepped into the little two-room hut to get out of the drizzle. Whoa, Clamity said, echoing my own sentiment as he came to a stop. Rainwater dribbling off the brim of his black desperado hat. I'd seen enough of the ravages of time and scattered refuse that was left behind after generations of scavengers. This wasn't it. Pictures were slashed apart. Furniture was smashed under hooves. Small treasures were defiled. I'd also seen the malicious destruction of raiders. The wreckage in the cottage was much closer to that, but this wreckage was old, bearing all the signs of predating the apocalypse. The torn pictures were so faded with age that they were unintelligible and the furniture was rotting. The stuffing in the rippled pillows had turned to dust, presuming that they were not stuffed with dust to begin with. It gets worse, Steelers warned. I stepped further inside, and turned a corner revealing the collapsed remains of a skeleton on the floor beneath a hanging noose. Any physical clue as to whether the owner of that skeleton had hung himself, or been lynched, had been obliterated by the past. Clemente kicked over the pile of broken chairs, then trotted into the kitchen to see if there was anything worth saddlebagging in the fridge. A minute later, I heard the pop and hiss of an opening cola bottle. Clearly, his search had borne fruit. I poked at a terminal lying amongst the rubble, its screen smashed by a hoof, then stopped taking a closer look. It was one of those newer models I had been finding at operational everywhere. And upon closer examination, the terminal was still running. Whoever destroyed it had fallen prey to the common, yet silly misconception, that breaking the screens had any effect on the device's spell matrix. Clementy trotted back in, holding a sunset's vasperilla in his teeth and taking a swig. I floated a few tools and crouched next to the terminal. Steel was regarded Calamity. Are we on a date? Calamity spit his sunset's vasperilla spraying it around the neck of the bottle as he choked. What now? He asked, dropping the bottle, tears in his eyes. I stopped what I was doing, staring, then collapsed in laughter. Serves him right. I had presumed that you had seen the decoration on the floor and were coming to find me, Steelers noted. But now I see you're all dressed up. 
beating at his armored chest with a hoof. The Pegasus shook his head, coughing. Once he had his breath again, he answered, Nah, we're headed up to Zebra Town to save a hoofful of prisoners from Olicorns. I noticed that he didn't mention the, the prisoners were zebras. So, you with us, mighty Olicorn Hunter? I'd almost forgotten that title. Steelhoofs was strangely silent. I looked at him, wondering if I should be concerned. Was he thinking about Arbu again? Zebra Town. Steelhoofs voice slowly. Yep. I would rather not. There was an unpleasant tone in his voice. I looked at Zenith, who just shook her head sadly, and walked back into the rain. But I will. Steelhoofs sounded greatly displeased. It is what Applejack would have wanted her rangers to do. I nodded, feeling both sorrow and pride in our ghoul companion. I turned back to the terminal, connecting to my pit buck, and began running a quick diagnostic. My eyebrows shut up as I realized the terminal was safeguarded with some pretty heavy magical countermeasures. I was sure I could hack it, but the price of failure would be more than a simple lockout. I turned away from the others, and put my full focus on the terminal, hacking through it with my pit buck. After a few minutes, I had to back out and try again. How did I encounter a terminal of this level of security since the Ministry of Morale in Manhattan? Now, I was intently curious. Curious, Why would a prony or zebra living in such a humble hut have a need for a terminal with such security that rivaled that of the mayor of the Ministry of Morale? A few minutes later, I backed out again, just barely avoiding tripping the security spells embedded into the terminal. This was insane. The damn password was 30 characters long. The fuck? I tried a third time, and a fourth. By my fifth try, I was beginning to suspect that the terminal only existed to frustrate the living hell out of me. Zenith returned, several strips of leathery flesh from the Bloodwing's wings dangled in her mouth. She shook, flinging water over the rest of us, then put the strips into her satchel, ignoring nasty looks from the dripping calamity. On my sixth attempt, I finally broke in. The password was Astronomical Astronomer's Almanac. I felt a brief wash of empathy with whoever put their hoof through the terminal screen. The terminal had not weathered the years well far worse than the similar models, but that was to be expected with part of its innards exposed. Still, there were a number of files that I was able to download into my pit buck, including several entries from a journal. From the journal, A Midnight Shower. Day 1. Today is the first day of my mission-imposed exile from the refined walls of Canterlot. I arrived in Zebra Town at the stroke of eight the royal guards dropping me and my bags off into a small trot from the city limits. I did not blame them for not wanting to travel closer, and with Celestia's sun shining down above and a cool breeze coming off the mountains, the day invited a walk. My levitation spell is enough to carry my positions for such a short distance and prevent the walk from being a burden. Although, I admit, I was a little concerned for the safety of the priceless heirloom with which I had been entrusted. I would say that this is a fair town by Equestria standards, but Zebra Town does not hold itself to the standards at all, now does it? Still, it is far better than the complete hovel I expected. I had heard that there was a town somewhere out in the dirtier parts of Equestria that the Earth Ponies had built in merely a year. Well, if that was true, then maybe there is a little Earth Pony in the Zebras and I do not mean that in an offensive or seedious manner. For in just a few years, they had turned a poverty-ridden shantytown at the very hoof of Canterlot into something rather impressive. Most impressive, I must say, is the elevated aqueduct that runs up the mountain and directly under Canterlot, catching the water which spills continuously from our glorious capital's moat and distributing it to not only through the town but the farmland beyond. And to think that this entire place was not even a concept not so long ago. But then, 
there was no real need for segregation until the zebra massacred our children at Little Horn. Not that I believe the zebras, who are upstanding equestrian citizens, should all be moved here, mind you. There are plenty of zebras in Canterlot. I even have a friend who is a zebra. But, in the more backward, bumpkin parts of the kingdom, with the increasing anti-zebra war sentiment, it is simply not safe for them to be amongst normal ponies. It really is better this way. That said, I was pleased to learn that the hut which Princess Luna had provided for the duration of my research here is actually a few miles outside the town proper. As for the hut itself, it is... cozy. Far from the refinements and luxuries I have been accustomed to in the castle, but I am but a scholar, not a noble, and I have it in my blood to make do. Being unburdened, as I am with the nobility's allergen, to anything plebeian. I spent this afternoon getting settled in, including the task of troubleshooting the new terminal. Why is it that any new piece of arcano technology always seems to come with more headaches than the one it replaces? Of course, a fair part of the difficulties may have arisen from the installation of the security spell submatrix, but considering the sensitive nature of my research, it would not simply do to have one of the of the striped with an unhealthy sense of curiosity, go poking around my affairs, now would it? Tomorrow, I shall trot back to Zebra Town, and try to get acquainted with the town and its citizenry. Being able to establish a degree of good relations will be critical before pursuing avenues of inquiry. What can you tell us about Zebra Town? I asked Steel Hooves, having to shout to make my voice heard over the distant roar of rushing water. The Applejack Ranger the response was, Look up. I lifted my head, holding up a hoof to shield my eyes from the downpour. The drizzle had lasted a few hours and had thickened, working through another tempest. Dark mountain cliffs rose sharply above us, and as my gaze ascended, I saw Canterlot. The broken majesty of the castle and surrounding city jutted out into the mountainside almost directly above us. I had expected it to be shrouded in a haze of pink, but the rain painted the ornate ruins in the same pallid drab gray as the rest of the Equestria. Multiple waterfalls, violently engorged by the rain, plunged down from above with the roar of a thousand manticores. Follow the largest of the waterfalls, and it'll lead you to Zebra Town, Seals informed us. I watched the torrent plummeting down, parallel to the sheer cliffs, until I met with a, mar a multi-arched structure, which reminded me, oddly, of the Philadelphia roller coaster, washing over it with an unending, thunderous bellow. Although a few foothills still blocked our view of Zebra Town itself, the village was very close now. What's it like? I asked. The guru responded with a stereotypical, laconic, yet ominous, bad. And here I expected him to say something even less helpful, like, wet. Silu doesn't raise to the bait. You have been told what happened to Canterlot, he said. When the first missiles were inbound, the princesses joined together to raise the Alicorn shield over the entire city. The shield was massive. It had to be. They weren't just protecting the castle, but the entire city up there that you can't see, easily from down here. I nodded. The royal castle was only the most visible landmark from below. Ministry Walk was in Canterlot, as was Princess Celestia's school for gifted unicorns. And who knew how much more? I could spot fragments of a winding road, switchbacks carved into the mountains for chariots and carriages to make an ascent. I was picturing it now, the princess's potent shield being bombarded awash with fire and shaken by explosions. I knew that Alicorn shields hampered sound and vision, but I still wondered what it must have been like for the ponies cringing inside. When the zebra's mega spell went off, the shield filled with the pink cloud, so thick you could not even see the shadow of the castle inside of it. In my mind's eye, I now saw Cantalot replaced by a, on the cliffside by a solid pink bubble, 
like a gargantuan bubblegum flavored candy jawbreaker. Their shield continued to trap the red cloud, or the pink cloud, for hours, while the steel rangers and others attempted to evacuate the towns in these foothills. Zebra Town lies directly beneath Canterlot. It was hit the hardest when the shield went down. Steelers looked to me. You may want to consider this a dry run for Canterlot itself. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. Day 2. My first attempts to befriend the residents of Zebra Town were met with suspicion and guarded politeness, but no hostility. And, considering the state of things here, I regard that as a small triumph on my part. Aside from the differences in architecture, and of course the glaring stripedness of the inhabitants, I could almost believe I was in an extremely poor backwater pony town. Ponyville, perhaps. Of the two things that stood out to me the most, the reluctant, genuinely uh, geniality of the population was something I could expect to find in almost any hub of civilization that had not yet ascended to the heights of society where the thinness and chill of the air requires an extra coat of snobbery. The other matter was altogether more telling and far more jarring, and that was how the war had left its hoof print on Zebra Town. Aside, that is, from the mere existence of the place. First, I found none of the patriotic posters or billboards that are beginning to dominate Canterlot. I hardly expected signs remaining, or reminding the residents of how much better and more virtuous they were than zebras, nor encouragements to join the war effort, but I was surprised to not find a single poster relating to any of the ministries. In fact, the only hoof print of the ministries in all of Zebraville is the occasional patriotic song belted out by one of those new sprite bots. There are a few of them bobbing around town, and just like the ponies in Canterlot, the zebras pay them little attention. Honestly, that song inspires patriotism from the first 100 times you hear it, and that it will inevitably stop doing so within the first 1,000. The other hoof print is the presence of soldier ponies here. This, I am given to understand, is a very new development. Ever since the assassination attempt of Princess Celestia, the zebra residents of Zebra Town have been subject to harassment from ponies in nearby towns. Princess Luna has put her hoof down, stationing some of Equestria's finest in Zebra Town for the residents' protection and safety. The road to Canterlot had become a raging river. Calamity held me as we flew over the muddy waves, my horn glowing. Behind us, Steelhoofs and Zenith rode an arched stone bridge which floated through the air behind us, surrounded by the glow of my magic. Centuries of these storms had torn the bridge from its original moorings and washed it into the valley where I had found it half buried in mud. Pyrolite flew along beneath it, taking advantage of the stone canopy. Her occasional breaths of fire reflected by the churning waters below. Seeing the river that the road had once become, I again rethought our decision to leave the sky banner behind. The little bridge had become my compromise. It was large enough to carry the prisoners we intended to free as well, and if the streets of Zebra Town were flooded, the stone bridge was less likely to float away while we were busy rescuing than a passenger wagon. Suddenly, my head began to pound. I felt a terrible tightness in my horn. Strange red tint flooded my vision. My magic wavered threatening to implode. I tried to focus harder, but the throb in my head rose to a scream. Parlet let out a screaming squawk. I was barely able to hear Steelhoofs shouting to Calamity, Up! Get higher! Fast! As I felt a tug, as Calamity grunted painfully, flapping his wings harder, I could hear Zenith let out an agonizing moan. Then, as quickly as the torment had gone, or had come, it was gone. The screaming pain in my head was gone. My hearing cleared. I gasped, blinking away tears and the swimming redness. I wiped the tears from my eyes and then stared at my hoof, aghast as the smears of red quickly washing away in the rain. 
I had been bleeding from my eyes. Wha- What? I felt Calamity relax. His flying, shaky. Behind me, Zenith's voice seemed to shudder. By the ball sex of a thousand star devils, who dropped the moon on us. Okay, that swear was just disturbing, although her description was apt as any. Broadcaster, Stilhu said, his voice betraying no hints that he had suffered as we did. There are probably several scattered about, washing out of Cantalot by the rain. I glanced behind us at the river we had passed. The broadcaster had was somewhere under the waves. We couldn't have seen it. I couldn't even hear the static over the roar of the waterfalls. There had been no warning until the effect began to kill us. I turned my stare forward again as, the, as we crested the last hill. Zebra Town sprawled out before us. The ruins had been left undamaged by the war, only to be slowly battered down by the hoof of time and constant floods. Most of the zebra huts were collapsed, leaving not even skeletons. A small maze of crumbling shops and zebra insulin, insule, lined the merchant roads. A few larger buildings formed gray masses shrouded behind streets of falling water. The largest waterfall from Canterlot, engorged by the storm, crashed like a widening mountain cliff less than a quarter mile from the edge of Zebra Town. Its roar filled the air. The pounded uh, aqueduct stood under the onslaught, delivering part of the waterfall's payload directly into the town along an elevated channel. But the structure, which had survived hundreds of years under the falls, had collapsed at several points within the town itself. The water, now pouring into the streets instead of flowing out into the hills, which had been the zebra's cropland. As we flew over the streets of Zebra Town, I saw veins of pink swirling in the air and the water. The rain proved a double-edged sword, washing the pink cloud out of the air. We could remain safely outside, but we dared not set hoof in the shallow lakes that had once been the streets. At least we would be able to keep our armor on. I used my pit buck to locate the zebras. I looked up at the Cantalot ruins above us, wondering what the rain was doing to the city above. Clearly, rains like this had happened many times before, and the plink cloud always returned. Stuoves would have told us if it were otherwise. But would entering Cantalot during a storm make our mission safer or more dangerous? From the journal, A Midnight Shower. Day 3. I spent another day in Zebra Town, acquainting myself with the proprietors of several of the businesses where I may later make inquiries, as well as presenting myself to the Zebra Constabulary within the Zebra Town Police Station. The local law was quick to inform me that Zebra Town operates under the same laws as the rest of Equestria, and that the zebras are more than capable and willing to police their own. They offered to show me their vault of confiscated items and contraband if I doubted their efforts. Believing I had gotten off to the wrong hoof, I swiftly assured them that I was not here for any matter of the ministries or military, and that I was just conducting personal research for a thesis. I received even more suspicious looks at that, as well as one rather rude inquiry as to whether I was researching inherent zebra inferiority. As if any pony would want to want or need to do such a thing. No, I reassured them confiding instead that I was doing a study on zebra astrology. To my dismay, this produced an even worse reaction than the notion I was researching zebra inferiority, and it took all my note not inconsiderable charisma and local graces to assure them that my studies were benign. Still, I left the encounter feeling a little shaken and slightly alarmed at the task before me. The thoughts I find most particularly d disturbing are the images my mind conjures of the locals' reaction should they learn the truth behind my research. So where do you expect the zebras are being held? 
Calamity said, as we flew over a large open area, dominated by one of the fountains, with a statue in the form of Princess Celestia. Water pressure from the raging aqueduct had caused the fountain to blast streams of water from Celestia's eyes, wingtips, and horn, like they were pressurized hoses. I had my EFS up, but the only lights on my compass were my friends, and the occasional pulse of red. I could never get a fix on the enemy, or enemies, that my EFS was picking up before they vanished again. That was making me nervous. There are not many structures left to hold them in, Zena said. The sight of the ruined zebra town having no apparent effect on her. I don't believe the Olicorns would choose one of the smaller shops as a base, as she was noted. It doesn't fit their sense of ego. That narrowed down the search area considerably. On the other hoof, they could be using zebra town sewers. And that just widened it a lot. Sewers, I moaned. That would, exp would explain why the town ain't even more flooded than this, Calamity praised. I'm guessing they build them to handle spring flood, amongst other things. My companions flared red again. Well, my compass flared red again. As we swept over a large, broken rooftop of a row of zebra houses and flew out over what had once been the Zebra Town Amphitheater. It was now a large inner city lake. Crumbling walls of columns and archways ringed the old amphitheater. Each column that still remained intact was crowned with stone carved masks of alien and most unwelcoming designs. I cringed at the thought of attending a performance with those wicked looking faces staring down at me from every column of the theater. Standing in one of the rain-shadowed archways was the near-black form of an olicorn. She saw us the moment, uh, at the exact same moment, we spotted her. Then, she vanished with a flash. Fuck. It was one of the teleporting ones. Expect company, Steelers warned. We had to get out of this guy. We were too easy a target. Clementa flew towards the largest intact structure, dropping me to the cracked roof before setting himself down. Pyrolite dotted out from under the stone bridge just before it slammed onto the rooftop, spilling steel hooves and zenith. The Applejack's ranger landed with a graceless thud, while the zebra somersaulted gymnastically, ending on all fours, and turning to stare at this grumbling ghoul with a raised eyebrow and the slightest hint of a smirk. My fault, I called out, as Shilu's pushed himself back up. A loud groan rumbled through the roof underneath my hooves. I knew immediately that it was about to collapse. It had been on the verge of collapsing for decades, and our landing was the final insult. Look at my companions. I whimpered. I hate ceilings. Ceilings, roofs, floors, anything that could tumble out from underneath me. In all the fucking wasteland, they were my greatest enemy. I started to focus, intent on levitating myself and my companions, and possibly laughing victoriously. The roof caved in, sending plumes of pink gas upwards at us. My vision blurred, my head throbbed, my lungs fought for proper air, my spell imploded, and I fell into the pink. My body hit the floor in a chamber of thick pink gas. The pink cloud had seeped through the cracks in the ceiling and collected here. The medical assist spell in my pit buck started to flash warnings across my EFS as my internal organs began to suffer. My heart felt strained, my lungs struggled to take in enough air, and I could feel something terribly unpleasant in my bowels. There will be pockets where the pink cloud has settled and pooled. Sulips had warned us. Avoid them if you can. Dash through the metal haste if you cannot. While still only a fraction of the potency of the original cloud, such pockets will kill you in seconds. I pulled on my Pitbox auto map, checking the orientation towards the nearest door. This way, I tried to shout, my voice fighting for volume. 
Follow me. I charged for the door, praying that the room beyond was safe. If not, I would likely be dead before I could find another. I hit the door, throwing it open. To my dismay, the hall beyond was curtained with the same cloying pink. Half of the doors along the way were open, offering no salvation. The pink cloud would kill me before I reached the end of the hall. Galloping to the first closed door, I screamed wretchedly as I found it locked. I was in no condition to pick a lock. I hurled myself at the next, my heart feeling like it was about to explode. My lungs were burning, my vision getting dark. The door opened. I tore into the next room, praising Celestia as the pink cleared, only to thud against the stone railing. My EFS was still flashing warnings, and the compass was all manner of red. I needed a health potion to reverse the damage of the pink cloud, and fast before my organs started to fail. With severe alarm, I realized that Velvet Remedy still had all of our medical supplies. My vision was dark, but clearing. Calamity shot past me, hovering in the air just beyond the railing. As she lives in Zenith galloped through the door behind me, I heard a crunching sound from below. Looking around, I realized we were on a semi-circular stone balcony, overlooking a cavernous tilted room flooded with water. Much of the water was shadow shallow enough to wade through, but there were sunken pockets where it was very deep. Streams of pink swam like ribbons in the floor. The room below us had several small tiers, the steps between becoming waterfalls, and hosted many balconies and exits. A dozen zebras looked up at our appearance, with hostile expressions and dead eyes. Lovely choice, Zenith intoned, sounding terribly weak. If we wish to avoid the poisoned water, what better place than a bathhouse? The balcony shifted under our hooves. Not again, I groaned, throwing my spell around myself and my companions, as the tiled floor beneath us canted dangerously. A semicircle of stone tore away from the wall, smashing down into the tilted floor below, shattering a hole in it. The four of us hovered over the bathhouse interior, surrounded by my magic. Ha! I yelled down the ruins of the balcony, ignoring the odd looks I was getting from Calamity. Ha ha ha! In response, a host of voices whined strangely from below. Several of the dead-looking zebras galloped towards the exits in the rooms beneath us. Water had begun to gurgle down into the hole created from the fallen balcony. The air filled with, a, with explosions as Steely opened fire with his grenade machine gun, the grenades tearing the bodies of zombie zebras apart. The room was filled with blasted water and flying chunks of tile and concrete. At least three of the dead zebras made it to the exit, but most died in the onslaught. Zenith cried out as one of the escapees came charging up the pink hallway and leapt out the still open door behind us, waves of pink mist curling out after it as it soared through the air and impacted with steel hooves, knocking them both out of my levitation field. The zombie zebra and the ghoul plunged into the pools below with a splash. Well, he could use a bath, Zenith commented as we floated above the pool, watching the dark figures of the two who fight under the water, neither of them able to drown. Y'all figure he needs any help? Calamity asked. We both shook our heads. Where's Pyrolite? I asked, suddenly realizing we were down a party member. Clemity scowled, blushing a little. Still flying around outside, I reckon. Bird's smart enough not to fall through a roof when she has wings. For Calamity's sake, I tried not to smirk. The floor around the pools was slowly draining. Casting about, I spotted a row of yellow medical boxes. Salvation, assuming there were any potions to be found inside. Telekinetically, Pulling myself from the others, I flew up to the medical boxes. The first was unlocked, and yet still full of medical supplies. Zebra Town had not suffered the looting that had emptied nearly every other locked, unlocked box in the wasteland. If this is what Zebra Town was locked, like, 
How about Canterlot? I suddenly understood Stilu's concerns about distractions. My head was still throbbing. My breathing was painful, fast, and shallow. My gut twisted inside me, as if something seemed to sh shift, burning in my bowels. I didn't need any medical assist spell to know I was on the verge of something inside me failing. And I was the first out of the cloud. My friends had it worst. I followed the healing potions I found up to Calamity and Zenith. Planning to use the first one I found in the next box myself. The next was locked. My vision became slowly darkened further as I focused on the lock. A new red light sprung up on my EFS compass. Turning, I saw a zombie zebra push through a doorway, its seemingly lifeless eyes fixed on me, flaring with unholy light. I whipped out my zebra rifle, sending three bullets straight in its head. Poof, poof, poof. I could see the flare of orange flame as the corpse's brain burned. The zebra stumbled over and went down like a sack of flour. Turning back to the medical box, I finally got it open. Celestia licked me like she loves me. There was a super restoration potion inside. I downed it quickly, before my vision could fade entirely, and I lost the ability to focus anymore. At once, my vision started to clear. My breathing became easier. My heart started to beat more strongly in my breast. My ears filled with an unnatural grating sound. I turned, as the dead zebra was lifting back onto its hooves, in a swirl of unholy energy. But, but, but I shot it in the head. With fire! <coughs> the canterlot zebra proved just how much it didn't care as it struck out at me with its hoof. The impact bruised through my armor, sending my weightless body flying backwards. My head struck one of the medical boxes, exploding in pain and stars as I collapsed into the water. I could hear Xena splash down as my magic imploded. I felt a sickly warmth in my mane. The medical assist flashed warning of head trauma. But between my previous concussion and the weakening from the cloud, I feared I may have suffered permanent damage. The fear washed away as I passed out.